For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everyone knows that verse. Now, I'm joking about the scaring thing. You know, I do, I do appreciate so much the heritage that I was privileged to grow up under with godly parents. And I do remember my father at a very early age setting me down, my sister, and sharing the, what we call the Romans road with us. And I remember this verse. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And I want to show you this morning in a few minutes something really special about that verse. I really think we fail to appreciate what Paul is saying and what his readers and those who were hearing this letter heard when Paul said, for all have sinned. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. You know, it is Paul is the only writer of the New Testament that ever calls Jesus Christ Jesus. Every other apostle and writer of the New Testament uses the phrase Jesus Christ, but Paul says, often he says Christ Jesus. Now, you, you can research that. It's a beautiful reason why Paul puts often the name Christ before Jesus. Whom God set forth as a propitiation, that's an important word today, propitiation, by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness because in His forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time His righteousness, that is, God's righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now, that's the text before us today. I'll give you a heads up. We're going to take two Sundays to just finish this section because it's so important. And we won't get through the entire outline that you have before you in your bulletin this morning. And now as we've seen, guys, so far, Paul has set forth in a very clear and in a sustained way the case that all mankind is under this systemic and radical hold of sin. And what Paul had in mind, just think about it, what, what he had in mind, what did he have in mind when he said, all have sinned? Now, today we know that verse, and we have read it, many of us, most of our lives, and, and really some have come to believe, strangely enough, they've concluded that some would be use this to justify their continuing in sin. Well, all have sinned, we're all sinners, so we, we'll just continue in sin and hope for the best at the end. And then others might conclude, since we're all sinners, God will deal with us eventually on an equal basis. You'll be fair, we're all sinners. And that's a form of what is called universalism. Ultimately, God is going to forgive everyone and save everyone because, you know, Paul said we're, we've all sinned. But I want you to think this morning with me for just a few minutes of what Paul's fellow countrymen, his fellow Jews, would have thought or the way they would have reacted when they heard these words or read these words. Paul, thinking about his fellow Jew, said, all have sinned and come short or fallen short of the glory of God. Their reply might have been, Paul? Are you saying we're no different than the Gentile infidels that we live with in this country? Are you putting us in the same category as the non-Jew or the Roman? And Paul would say, yes. Outside of Jesus Christ, we're all on an equal footing as we stand before a holy God, even those people 
who were very religious and they knew the law and they had done their best to keep the law. You remember when the rich young ruler came to Jesus and he said, Teacher, tell me, how can I inherit eternal life? I want to, I want to go to inherit this kingdom you're talking about. And Jesus, you remember what Jesus said to him? He said, well, go and, and keep the law. And you remember the young man's reply? He was a Jew. He said, I've done that from my youth up. Now, I don't think he by any means was saying that he was completely perfect and had never broken any of the laws. But the point he was making is, I am a Jew. I'm a very religious person. I know the law. Paul is saying, even those, my brothers, blood brothers, are all sinners apart from Jesus Christ. Now there's a doctrine that theologians call the doctrine of total depravity. And I want to talk about that for a minute. You, you know that, most of you know that doctrine, total depravity. But I want you to understand that when we say total depravity, it doesn't mean that every person is as bad as he or she could possibly be. You know, Osama bin Laden was an evil person, but he could have been worse. When we speak of total depravity, we're speaking of something else. And I think a better phrase would be radical depravity. I think that better describes this great doctrine that Paul teaches throughout the book of Romans. And radical depravity or total depravity means that every facet or the totality of our being has been corrupted by sin. Every facet. That means that our minds have been corrupted by sin. Now I've used this example. I've, I can be driving down the road, going to an appointment, or driving to the church, or just doing something, and my mind is just wandering around, you know, in, in, in a normal way, and all of a sudden, here comes this thought in my mind, and, and it's a depraved thought. And I say, where did that come from? It comes from the fact, the reality, that my mind has been impacted by sin. And I still suffer that way. Our, our emotions are impacted. Our wills have been impacted by sin. Even our bodies. Not only do we groan physically because of sin, but Paul even told the Corinthians, be careful because you can use the members of your body in sinful ways. So total depravity means that every, or the totality of our being is corrupted by sin. And the cause is found in verse 18. Look back. See, you need your Bibles open. Let's see, this is not on the screen. I don't think I put this on the PowerPoint. But in verse 18, Paul says, here's the reason why. There is no fear of God before their eyes. There's no fear of God. That, that is, there's no reverence for God. Even though we're radically depraved, it doesn't mean, guys, we're incapable. Or, yes, of, it doesn't mean that we're incapable of producing some mighty fine behavior. I mean, humanly, we can really produce some good stuff. Just look around. There's some great organizations in existence today and because people are just doing good and part of that's because of the common grace of God but man can produce some pretty self-righteous acts there are good people around I have good neighbors we, we've been vacationing in Orlando and this week with the grandkids and uh, we were just I was just so impressed by how friendly people are good people I know you're pretty good 
I enjoy being around you, and I think you enjoy being around me. But you know what? When we really get to the heart of the issue and open up, as if, if we could see as God sees, we would understand really how depraved even good people are. The Russian novelist Turgenev, or Ivan Turgenev once wrote in one of his books, he says, I do not know what the heart of a bad man is like, but I do know what the heart of a good man is like, and it's terrible. See, our radical corruption, corruption presents us with a, this great dilemma that Paul lays out before us in our text today. How can we ever be made right in the sight of God? You see, we stand up, we, we're facing, Paul says, a divine justice, the justice of God. And that demands the condemnation of sin or sinful man. God's justice demands that. And yet, God has a divine love that wants to reach out to those who are guilty. And thank God for that. So God answers God, God's answer is totally sufficient for our total failure. And this brings me to what I believe may be the most important verses in the book of Romans, our text today. <laughs> you know, we, we, we turned a corner here this morning. Because verse 21 is that other bookend to the first part of Romans. We looked at that first book in back in Romans chapter 1 and I can go back over there and read for the wrath of God is revealed no verse 17 for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith that's the first book in here's the other book in but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed Paul saying basically the same thing just in another way and in between those two verses we saw 59 verses of an explanation of who we really are apart from Christ, and it was an ugly thing. And Wade and I shared in that preaching and teaching part, and uh, we often talked about how I'll really be glad when we get finished with this section and get to better news. Well, here's the good news. But now, but now a righteousness, or the righteousness from God apart from the law is revealed. It has been made known. Then there's another great doctrine, and we'll talk more about it next Sunday, but look down in our text in verse 26. To demonstrate at the present time His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier. See, there's a, another great doctrine. Paul uses this word justified, just, the justifier. This is the doctrine of justification. And that's the doctrine that God pardons. He accepts and declares the guilty. He declares Richard Hall, the sinner, to be just. On the basis of Christ's righteousness. So let's look this morning at just point A. The miracle of justification. A righteousness apart from the law. I, I see in here three, three miracles of, of this great doctrine of justification. And the first one is this. In verse 21, a righteousness apart from the law. Now I want you to understand this morning that there is a difference between human righteousness, or our, and I don't say self-righteous simply as often we use the term, you're so self-righteous. I don't use it in that particular way. I'm using the term self-righteous as in our own works of righteousness, our own religion, our own self-works that we can do and that can be laudable here on the human race, on this earth. And I'm saying to you this morning, there's a difference between our human, our self-righteousness and the righteousness from God. No self-righteousness ever came close to this special righteousness that comes apart from the law. 
Now, in this doctrine of justification, there is a legal aspect to it. A declaration has been made. Those, we stand before the bar of God, guilty. But the judge declares that someone has stepped in and taken the penalty that we deserve. We're, we're guilty. But someone has stepped in to our place and said, I'll serve, I'll pay his penalty, let him go free. So there is a legal aspect. But there's not just a legal aspect to the doctrine of justification. justification. There is also a status that we need to understand. There's a status of righteousness before God. And it comes to us as a gift. And it's infinite, infinitely beyond any self-righteousness that we could ever produce. In fact, it is a divine righteousness that comes to us in and through a person. And that person, of course, is Jesus Christ. Paul says in verse 21, it has been made known to which the law, he meant the Ten Commandments, and the prophets have testified of this great truth. Now the law was given to us as a guide. It was a good thing. It's a tutor. The law teaches us. And it reveals to us our true condition. And you've heard many illustrations about the law and why it was good. Paul will later say in Romans that it is, the law is holy and righteous and good. Well, how can something that can condemn us and show us really our true condition be good? And I think about, this is, uh, when I first began to understand the law, I remembered as a child when my father decided to build an extra garage behind our home. And uh, I re as I was fascinated, it's probably 10 years old or something, fascinated by uh, all the professional carpenters who came in and they did their special thing to build that garage and and uh, e each afternoon I, was, I would go out and uh, I'd want to get part, you know, of the lumber because I wanted to build something. And, and uh, the carpenters would come back and they would complain to my father, well, look, we didn't mean to throw that away. That, that's something we wanted to use today. And I had taken it off and, and was using it to build. I wanted to build a, a clubhouse. Finally, my father said, look, if you'll be patient, when we finish this garage, I promise you, I'll, there'll be enough left, and you can build your clubhouse. So I waited, and, and it was, uh, it, it, there was enough. My father, I remember, he gave me a, a handsaw and a hammer and a bucket of nails, and he said, go at it. And I did. Now, my father was wise. He said, you can build your clubhouse, but it can only be behind the garage. Because I don't want your mother looking out the kitchen window and having to look at your clubhouse. <laughs> so I, I went to work with that saw and all by myself. I don't know how long it took me, but I eventually built that clubhouse. And you know, when I finished, and, and I had shingles and all left over, and I, I just did everything. And when I finished, I remember one day I was looking at that thing, and, and that clubhouse compared to that garage was a mess. I didn't, I didn't know what a level was or a plumb line was. And that thing was all out of plumb. I remember trying to put a door on that thing. <laughs> it just wouldn't work. Any way I tried, I, it was either open at the top or open at the bottom. And, uh, but you get inside that thing and mosquitoes would eat you up. I mean, it was just a mess. And you know, years later, I, I would drive, when I would go to Arkansas, I would... Years later, I would drive past our old house where we grew up as children. And uh, I uh, would see that garage, and I, I would, for a while, I saw that clubhouse. But it wasn't long, that clubhouse was gone. But that garage was still standing. Now, here's the point. That is what the law, that's the good of the law. The law is like a tutor or a plumb line. It really shows us how really 
off we are. And how if we try to build our lives, our stand on our own self-righteousness, we are, will ultimately be condemned and like that old clubhouse of mine, swept away. It will not stand up to the holiness of God. And that's why God gave us the law. Now, lot, lot, not long after the law, if you remember in the Old Testament studies, no sooner had God given the law that God set up the priesthood. He set aside the Levites, a special tribe of Israel, and said, you're going to dedicate your life to serving the people and sacrificing the animals because I want to teach, I want to remind my people that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And so came the blood sacrifices. See, the laws insistent on blood sacrifices would, would remind Israel that mankind's works of righteousness would never be enough. It would never measure up. Some, someone had to die. And then we see it, of course, portrayed in the life and death of Christ. It becomes the greatest display of the radical righteousness of God. It was in Jesus Christ. And he's the only man, the only human, who ever deserved eternal life simply by the way he lived. No other human could accomplish what Jesus accomplished. And I call it the radical righteousness of God that's given to us. 1 Corinthians 1.30 Christ Jesus has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, our holiness, and our redemption. Now what does this radical righteous, righteousness mean to us? Everything, everything, our radical corruption, which we just talked about, is so clearly spelled out by Paul, it precludes any hope of making our way to heaven through self-righteousness. Only through the radical righteousness of Christ. The existence of righteousness apart from works gives all of us hope. And this special righteousness comes through the Lamb of God. Now, I want us to prepare, shift now our thoughts to what we're about to celebrate here before us. And I, I don't know how many of our children are in here this morning, but I want our children just to come up this morning, and I want you to sit. Let's, let's sit. Oh, we better sit over here. Kids, come up. I want to talk to you for just a few minutes. You can sit on this whole front row. If you're elementary age, come up here and sit right here. Let me talk to you a few minutes. And we're going to show some pictures on the screen that will help you. It will help all of us this morning. Because these are pictures that we have seen from the teaching in the Old Testament. Now, do you remember a man called Abraham? He becomes the father of the great, this new nation that's called the Hebrew people, they're the Israelites. And God calls Abraham out of his pagan land and he's sending, yes, Ur, and he's sending to this new land. He promises a new land and he makes a covenant. And do you remember Abraham has finally has a son and his name was Isaac. And one day God tells Abraham to take Isaac up on a mountain to sacrifice Isaac. And I think we have a picture if we... Do we have this? Here's a beautiful painting, very famous painting, of Abraham about to sacrifice Isaac. Do you see Isaac there? Abraham has his hand over Isaac's face, shielding him from the knife. And look, the angel of the Lord comes down and notice that he takes the hand of Isaac. 
And he grabs Isaac's hand that has the knife. And in this famous painting, Abraham has released the knife. It's a beautiful picture for us. That God is teaching us. See, God didn't require that Abraham off, offer Isaac as a sacrifice. He stopped him. And he made provision. I, when I see the angel of the Lord taking the hand of Isaac, it reminds me, and I see Isaac's, I mean, Abraham's hand opened up and the knife falling away. It reminds me that God says, I will provide a way. That's a beautiful picture of what God is going to do for us. You see, the Old Testament is really one great introduction to the New Testament. The coming of Christ, the Messiah. And then there's another picture I want to show you. This will help you. Do you remember the story of the Ark of the Covenant? God told Israel to build this Ark. And you remember one of the items in the Ark was the law, the Ten Commandments. And Israel was to take, carry the Ark of the Covenant, God's promise. They were to carry this ark with them all through their journeys. Now look at the ark of the covenant. The, the ark it, itself was golden and the top was solid gold. You see the top of the ark? It was solid gold. And there are two cherubims over the, standing over the top of the ark of the covenant. And they have their wings spread out. You see their wings are spread out touching? You know what, they are, what they're covering there? What below those wings was called the mercy seat. And God said to Israel, I want you to take the Ark of the Covenant with you. It's going to be a central piece of your worship. And he made a promise. He told Israel that I will meet you. My presence will come to you between the two cherubims on the mercy seat. And it was there in the early days of Israel, that the priest were to sprinkle the blood over that mercy seat, the top of the ark. And by doing so, if God accepted that sacrifice, he would, his presence would be made manifest, or his presence would be made known among the people of Israel. And they would be reminded that God was their God and he was going to save them. And so, listen, boys and girls, when you look at this table today, this table really is, is the New Testament version of that. The top of the ark was where the blood was sprinkled and that sacrifice was accepted. But it was pointing to this. Because this bread and this juice represent the ultimate, the best sacrifice. And the best sacrifice was a person, not an animal. And who was that person? Jesus Christ. And so when we, today, we take this bread and we break it, it reminds us of the body of Christ. And we drink the juice, it reminds us of what? The blood of Christ. So there's one more picture. See, there's this great, picture the, the really the the most important thing in our religion in our faith is it comes to us in a person Jesus Christ the son of God who dies really that becomes our mercy seat that's where we receive mercy from God through Jesus Christ our Savior and Paul is saying to us, we forget our own religion, forget our self-righteousness. We must come to God through Jesus Christ. That's why I call it the radical righteousness of God. And that's a gift to us. We just, you know what we have to do? We, we humble ourselves before Jesus Christ and say to Him, I trust in you. And what you have done for me. You can go back to your seats and sit with your parents. Would you bow your heads with me? I'm going to ask our elders to come forward.
and we will spend a few minutes in prayer. You can prepare your hearts this morning to receive this wonderful the wonderful elements that remind us of the wonderful sacrifice of Jesus our Lord who gives us his righteousness. This is a good time to confess any sin that may be discouraging you in your life and it's a broken real intimate fellowship with the Father or broken relationships, human relationships. Confess those. Receive His forgiveness. And enjoy the reality of the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. Father, we come now and we just simply say, Bless the Lord, O my soul and all that is within me. Bless your holy name. And we pray this as we receive the elements this morning. In and through Jesus' name. Amen.